Good morning. My name's Tim Hinks and I'm a member here at Wheatley Community Church, along with my wife Naomi, who many of you all have met on Friday evening at the craft event showing her Pudini bonbons. And I hope the craft evening will have given you lots of ideas and enthusiasm for how we can celebrate Christmas this year. Christmas is going to be very different this year. With no awkward office parties, no crowds on the high streets, no extended family round for Christmas lunch. Actually, many of the festivities we enjoy have been stripped away, so this year may feel rather empty. A lonely end to a year of isolation. And yet there is some good in this. Because when all the trimmings of Christmas are stripped away, we're given a fresh chance to think again about Christmas and to ponder its real meaning. So we're going to spend a few minutes now just looking at a single sentence from the Bible from a book called John. We've already heard it read out by Poppy and seen the words from the children. It's also written on the back of this invitation card, if you've had one of those. Or if you've got a Bible, it's John chapter 1, verse 14. In this verse, I believe God has a message for each of us. And he wants us to think through that message this Christmas. As COVID has happened, I feel that God has been pressing the pause button on our lives and telling us just to stop and listen to him. And this is his message today. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This Christmas I'd ask you to take those words to heart. Maybe put the invitation card somewhere prominent, you can read it. And let the truth sink in. To help you, I'm going to unpack this verse with four words. And the first of these is this. History. The claims of Christianity are unique amongst the world's religions because they're rooted in eyewitness historical facts. These words were written by John, one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples. He writes, we have seen his glory. What we're dealing here with, what we're dealing here with is history. Eyewitness historical facts. It's confirmed by multiple independent eyewitnesses. The events are real history, falsifiable and reliable. We have seen his glory. These eyewitnesses record what they saw. They knew Jesus personally, they touched him, they lived with him. And we know from historical records both in the Bible and outside the Bible, from other contemporary sources, that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical figure. So the eyewitnesses are named. Current events are accurately recorded. Names of people and places are given. Current political events are noted, as are the names of religious leaders. And geographical details, architectural details, the events of Jesus' life are woven into the fabric of first century Israel. I wonder what you would say was the most glorious thing you have ever seen. Uh, you may know that my family and I spent a couple of years living in Australia. So I can say I have seen koalas and cockatoos and platypus. I've swum on coral reefs. I've watched the sun set over the Great Dividing Range. I've tasted a real Aussie barbecue. I've smelt the eucalyptus gum. I felt the sand of squeaky beach between my toes. You see, I have seen the glories of Australia. John writes, we have seen his glory. He has seen and knows Jesus. So this means that the facts of Christmas are not on a par with Harry Potter or Frodo and his friends or Shrek. The claims of Christianity are that it's true after the Watergate scandal, seven men couldn't keep the truth secret for one week. But with Jesus, 11 men went to their graves claiming that what they had seen and witnessed was truth. So this Christmas, will you read their accounts? The Gospels are a fantastic read. Perhaps a friend invited you to the craft evening. Well, they'd be happy to read through that book of John with you. Or you could check out our Alpha course. We've had great fun earlier this year exploring the meaning of life of a group of people from Wheatley. And... Al and I would be delighted to hear from you again if you'd like to take part in one of those this year. So if the first word was history, the second word is divinity. Jesus of Nazareth was no less than God the Almighty Creator in human form. John calls Jesus the Word. A word reveals you. If I stop speaking, 
you can't know me. A word reveals someone. It's true words that we communicate and God has spoken in a person, that person was Jesus. Earlier in his book, John writes, in the beginning was the word. You see, the claim of this verse is that Jesus is the one who was there in the beginning before the universe was created. And then he stepped into history at that point 2,000 years ago when he was born as a baby in a manger. You see, the claim that Christianity presents to us is that the baby in the manger is the God who created you, the universe, this earth, and who breathed life into you. No wonder that they trembled at the word of Jesus. No wonder that they were humbled by the power of Jesus. No wonder that they marveled at the purity of Jesus. No wonder that they worshipped at the feet of Jesus. You won't find this claim in any other religion or philosophy. And you see, it explains the things that Jesus did. How is it that he turned water into wine? How is it that he fed 5,000 people? How did he walk on the water and calm the raging storm? How did he get that power over evil? Why did angels sing their chorus of praise? Jesus is the word of God. You could say that Jesus is God unmuted. When we want to see God, we look to Jesus. He's like the live action replay of what God did in all his high definition. Jesus once said to his friend, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So to find God this Christmas, we don't have to go to an old chapel or a beautiful cathedral. God will only be found in Jesus. If you read on through John's Gospel, you'll find that Jesus says things that only God can say. Jesus knows things that only God can know, like telling the woman at the well her life story no one else knew. Jesus does what only God can do, raising the dead man, Lazarus, to life. At the cross, God dies. And then, three days later, he appears as a resurrected Lord to 500 people, even to doubters like Thomas. Jesus is divine. The pilgrimage for God ends in Jesus. Every other route is a dead end. Many won't accept this. The atheists won't allow the supernatural to happen. But the reasoning is flawed. I will not allow Jesus to be God because I won't allow supernatural things to happen. That's like saying I will not allow this evidence because it doesn't fit my conclusions. You don't have to be a scientist like me to spot the error. No, Jesus did supernatural things because that's what God does. Sometimes we have to radically change our thinking. In 1892, Dmitry Ivanovsky and Martinus Beidrink found that an infection could be caused by something far smaller than a bacterium. It couldn't be seen. It could be crystallised. It wasn't even alive. So they called it a virus. It didn't fit with their view of the world, but the evidence fitted the conclusions and it required a radical rethink. So too of Jesus. The Word became flesh. Why were the shepherds filled with joy while well, the Word of God dwelt amongst us? Who brought the wise men from the east? We have seen his glory. Why did Mary ponder and worship? He was full of grace and truth. So, what about you? Are you prepared to look at the evidence and accept that the baby in the manger is the Lord Almighty who formed you in your mother's womb? who knows everything about you, and who holds you in his hands. History, divinity. Our third word is intimacy. God stepped into this world because he cared about you enough to die for you. Social distancing has taught us that we're built for relationships, for relationships with each other and for relationship with God. And he wants us to live in relationship with him, no matter what that cost him. The word became flesh and made us dwelling amongst us. Perhaps you know the words of a Jane Osborne song, What if God was one of us? She says, if God had a name, what would it be? And would you call it to his face? If you're faced with him in all his glory, what would you ask if you had just one question? What if God was one of us? If God had a face, what would it look like? And would you want to know if seeing meant that you would have to believe in Jesus and in heaven and in all the saints? The message of Christmas is just that. God has become one of us. 
he's not chosen to remain remote. Perhaps for some of us, social distancing is a bit of a relief, an excuse to avoid the stress of that family gathering at Christmas. We're happier with 15 minutes on Zoom. Because relationships can be messy. There can often be a past history of hurt. But God's not into social distancing. He's not happy just doing Zoom. God knows the mess we've made of life. And yet, he still wants to be part of our relationship. Jesus knows that we've turned away from him. And that he knows the secrets in our hearts. The dark, that if we're honest, is there in each one of us. But he still came to become one of us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And that dwelling will last forever. The Bible ends with an amazing vision that God showed to John. He said, now the dwelling of God is with man and he will live with us and they with him. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Perhaps you find that hard to believe. If God really knew me, knew the things I've done, known the wrong in my heart, he wouldn't want to be with me. But Jesus knows it all. He knows your heart better even than you. By nature, we don't want to recognise God. We don't want to receive him into our hearts. And yet, and yet, despite that, despite the rejection, he came to dwell amongst us. In 1873, the 33-year-old missionary, Father Damien, was in Hawaii. And he heard that over 600 men had been exiled to the small island of Molokai because they had leprosy. They were unable to grow food for themselves and to care for themselves. Father Damien volunteered to go and be with them. There was no PPE. The disease was transmissible and incurable. Knowing the risks, he went and lived amongst them, dwelt amongst the lepers. He served as a priest, dressed their altars, built a reservoir, a church, homes. He built their coffins and dug their graves. He taught them, he led them, he ate with them. And after 11 years, he caught the leprosy from them that ultimately led to his death. And so too with Jesus. He was not ashamed to live with us, disfigured as we are by the wrong in our lives, helpless as we are without him. He didn't scorn poverty, rejection and suffering on our behalf. And ultimately he knew it would cost him his life to save us. So what about you? Jesus came to dwell amongst us, to have relationship with you. If we want to hold Jesus at arm's length, the truth is out about us that we don't want to know him. It's a choice many make. But why would you? The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. God wants to be in your life. Will you invite him in? History, divinity, intimacy. Lastly, mercy. God sent his son Jesus to show his mercy. We're told the son came from the father, full of grace and truth. Well, grace is God's undeserved favour to us. By nature, we've turned our backs on God and we deserve his judgment. But instead, he mercifully showers upon his blessing and favour and grace. Um, He came to wash away every sin in our lives, to free us from all the guilt in the past and leave us with a new life ahead of him. He wants to fill us with joy. That's why he sent Jesus, to give us life in all its fullness. Jesus came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In this world of fake news, deceits and half lies, Jesus came to bring truth, solid, dependable, reliable truth. And sometimes that truth can be uncomfortable and costly because the truth is that the wrongdoing in our lives, in your life and mine, needs to be punished. Jesus is full of grace, but he does not compromise that truth. And that's why the word became flesh that nails would go through his hands. For years I struggled to understand what the cross was all about. And then I discovered two sentences in a book called Romans. The first said that God did this to demonstrate his justice. That he would punish the sin and not compromise his truth. The second wonderfully says that God did this to demonstrate his mercy. It was God's grace to us, his mercy to you, that the person on the cross was not you or me, but Jesus. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So let me finish by saying, do we not need this? 
do we not need to reconnect with the word made flesh full of grace and truth? Grace is being able to receive things that we simply don't deserve, a relationship with our creator. He knows you through and through. He loves you and he entered into the squalor of this world that it, with all that's so wretched about it so that you might know him. Perhaps you're a Christian and have been for many years. Well, can I ask you again that this Christmas you'll be thankful for these truths? Will you take time to delight that God the Father sent his Son and he overflowed into your life with grace and truth? Perhaps you need more time to know him better. Well, read a gospel, talk to a friend who invited you along or find out about our Alpha course. Or just perhaps you're ready to, to respond and it's as simple as sorry, thank you, please. Saying sorry to God that I've neglected you and run my life my own way. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place on that cross. Please forgive me and take control of my life. Thank you for listening. Let me close with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son full of grace and truth. We're sorry for the times we've pushed you out of our lives. We thank you for sending Jesus. Please help us to live our lives your way. Amen. Thank you.